let me, uh, so in some of the PowerPoints I will jump over because you have already seen or commented from a different perspective. The question is how far water and migration is linked in the 21st century. You have seen already, and Andras mentioned already, how uh, important migration is for the human existence. And uh, uh, earlier in this year, in a Hungarian language public lecture, I said that if there would not have been migration, Hungary would not have been here, because the Hungarians migrated into this basin, and later some came from different directions. But the starting statement is that there are certain processes uh, with us, since generations or some since centuries, which we did not notice as important ones. And I would focus today especially on two things beyond what Andras already mentioned, uh, uh, land degradation and urbanization, so the rural urban context, and also, of course, on migration, which is seeming to uh, spiral out of control and out of imagination. You have seen this picture, and this picture tells us a lot of things that, yes, humans are changing the face of the world, but we have a planet which is actually gave humanity 10,000 years of exceptional period where all what we have achieved in civilization, in science, in, 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 in wealth was generated, and this is a Holocene, and there is no proof that this Holocene would continue. Now, human influence back and forth the world is looking for bumpier times ahead. And you saw in back in the last 100,000 years how bumpy it has been, how many big major changes occurred virtually without human interference. And I just only refer to a, a very uh, uh, less known phenomenon than every 250 years roughly, his, uh, statistically, uh, the uh, Earth experience a mega volcano uh, uh, Eruption. A mega volcano eruption, the last one happened in 1815 and it wiped out uh, European agriculture for a year. Now, for the time being, the food reserves of the world is about 80 days. So, uh, if no more food would come, the world could carry on 80 days and then would be mass starvation. Now, if you have a uh, volcano uh, eruption like this, which knocks out uh, one uh, vegetational period in one part of the world uh, is bad enough, but the other part may, uh, may produce it. But if both are knocked out, because it's a mega volcano uh, event, then we have a big problem. So the 80 days reserves uh, would not suffice to reach another uh, cropping period which could save the world. So we are living actually in a very dangerous place. Of course, uh, we would like to have fun, and these are blended out of our minds, but sometimes it's not bad to uh, be remembered. And this is changing, and I do not want to dwell on it because we have so, so enough, and Andras explained how many uh, 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 changes and how many uncertainties are in, involved in it. But we have also a very interesting assessment, 2005, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment Project, which revealed that 15 out of the big 24 ecosystem types of the world are in degraded or utilized unsustainable uh, at present to uh, provide specific services. And when you look into the human societies, the poorer you are, the more rural you are, your livelihood is more related to ecosystem services. So this is telling you that we are, again, uh, not dealing with our resources on a global scale sustainable, whatever it does, may mean. Uh, when I listened to the technological changes Andra showed, I realized that actually, the, and, and, and that uh, stationarity is dead, then sustainability is also dead. At least the sustainability which says to preserve what we know. We have to be much more dynamic, much more adaptive, much more forward-looking, imagining very unpleasant scenarios which may occur, occur within very short period. Uh, and the last number, that 2 billion people are living in dry regions, are extremely vulnerable, and loss, loss of ecosystem services are an essential finding of this uh, uh, report. And it was issued in 2005, 12 years ago. 
deliberately, I left uh, this uh, little uh, noted. I used these statements already in 2007 in a migration-oriented workshop in Bangkok. So people are not listening why scientists, and not only me and Andras, are telling these messages since more than a decade. Uh, the ecosystem assessment showed that uh, some of the uh, threats we already discussed are often. Of course, it's not shown here, but there are also good news. The European forests are one of the ecosystems which are in much better shape than 200 years ago. So turning around trends is possible, but turning around is not a one-year fix. It takes 100 years, 200 years, and so forth. Let me venture into a completely different area just to see how changes are possible and how changes take decades. 100 years back, or 120 years back, Sweden was one of the poorest countries in Europe. It lost one third, one third of its population to migration to the United States. Nowadays, Sweden is one of the richest countries in the world, accepting refugees and paying a lot of development aid all over the world. So there are possible changes, but it needs leadership, it needs determination, it needs social consensus, and it needs time. 100 years. And the agricultural services in Sweden were established already in the 18th century. So there are really, we have to think of very long-term trends to be initiated yesterday rather than today or tomorrow. Uh, Andras mentioned these key changes, and it shows that the 20th century is when something went out of proportions. Of course, it's created since 1950 much more wealth, much more welfare, much more uh, opportunities to many people, including Europeans. But, as uh, I will show, there are uh, population trends, which are quite obvious, which would not only offset these positive changes of the latest 20th century, but creates new challenges. Uh, there are certain uh, reasons of global change. And I added one to the uh, original PowerPoints, which Andras also used, OPSIN subsidies. We are having politically things which are not only bad, which are obscene. Using food stuff to uh, generate elect, uh, uh, for energy purposes, which is not even saving the planet for CO2, is absolutely obscene. In Germany, 20% of the arable land is used for energy crops in a world where people suffer hunger. Uh, Water-wise, the world is already, in many parts of the world, are out of balance. And you see that it's not only, or rather not the developing countries, but some uh, places in the world, even United States, European areas, are where we are using more water than is available. The uh, GRACE satellites, Andras mentioned, pointed out that the water withdrawal from India, which was creating for a medium term uh, some economic betterment of farmers, of subsidizing, pumping groundwater, changed the gravitational field of the world. As much water was pumped out of the aquifers in India. I'm not criticizing it because it makes some uh, intermediate progress, which can be used to come back to more sustainable livelihoods, but definitely the risks of going into political slogans and subsidizing and creating for 10 years, 20 years, some kind of betterment on the expense of the future is very dangerous. And the, uh, you see in this uh, picture that uh, against some dry lands of the world, but mainly in the so-called northern dry belt, in Northern Africa and Central Asia is the highest risk of desertification. So we are going to lose, likely to lose, if we continue as business as usual, uh, arable land into deserts with the consequences which we are all fearing. But science, as Andra said, is, is a very interesting stuff. The, uh, Ver Charlie Vereshmarty would love to see this PowerPoint because it's from him. In 20 years back, we saw the world as a, and the water world in national boundaries. You see that, of course, in uh, the MENA region, 
uh, uh, we used already more than 40% of the available water resources. And you see that some continents, because of relatively low population density like Australia, are extremely well off water-wise because there are not too many people who would, uh, and of course Latin America and the far north is the water-rich area of the world. Based on these statistics, you concluded that about 1.7 billion people are living in areas where uh, water is uh, readily available. Only 10% of the water is used. And only about half a billion is living in the high-risk areas where already more than 40% of the water resources are utilized. Now, if you go to the uh, pixel-wise uh, uh, analysis, like in the America shows that even in well-endowed regions, you have huge areas of water scarcity within national borders, you realize that 3.2 billion people are living in water-rich areas. People are not stupid not to live there, but also almost 2 billion are living in drylands. So the problem as a political and social problem changes completely just because of the resolution of scientific analysis. So it is very important that we know what, we, what message we are sending out and the big inequality shows that 16% of the world, world population is mastering half of the water resources and 84% on the driest half. It's again something long-term unsustainability. And when we look into the annual population growth, we see a very uh, odd picture. Uh, you saw already water availability, and you saw that where water availability is lowest, the population increases 3% annually. And on the areas where water is readily available, you have very light or even negative population growth. It's again an additional tension. Uh, you can, population dynamics or family planning is a profoundly personal matter. I'm completely aware that you cannot go anywhere in the world and say you should not have more than two children. But as a scientist, I feel it's an obligation uh, to show the pictures and take the analysis on data or information which is readily available in the internet to everybody. And the conclusions, I'll leave it to you. This is the northern uh, dry belt, and you see that the southern, uh, uh, the corresponding latitudes, you have again a dry belt in the south. The only difference is that the land mass is uh, distributed in a different way, and the northern hemisphere has much more land mass than the southern hemisphere. And I will come back later when I try to focus on Africa in my presentations. Let me go a little bit on the inequalities which do exist next to the water inequalities, which can definitely be seen as part of the driver of migration. And you see the wealth distribution of the world in the different big regions. And you see that basically Northern America, Europe, and the rich Asia Pacific, Japan, South Korea, uh, Taiwan area, where we have the big accumulation of wealth, not only income, but wealth. China is in a transition mode, and huge areas in the world, Africa, India, and the rest of the Pacific, uh, Asia Pacific, is where um, the most of the poor people, people whose assets are on the lowest size of the wealth distribution are located. And this is, uh, these inequalities are unfortunately changing to the worse. The income uh, distribution between the richest and poorest countries in 1961, 30 to 1, in 2000 it was already 80 to 1. So as, as we say, the seesaw is opening. And it's opening not only uh, between rich countries and poor countries, but even within rich countries. In Germany, the difference between poor and rich is increasing. And if we try to translate human well-being to something more than income, probably the life expectancy is the most common agreeable basis. You see that rich countries live twice as long, uh, rich country citizens, as in the poorest countries. Uh, if you are cynical, you can say, oh, at least they suffer half as long as others. 
but this is really a, would be a very cynical comment. And uh, on the other hand, you can say if you are rich, you enjoy twice as much life as if you are poor. It's again something which is an enormous tension or stress of the fabric of human societies all over the world. And we can continue on the hunger map of the world, showing in which uh, countries uh, how many percentage of the people are suffering uh, uh, regularly of hunger. And then we come to a kind of table. I'm, I don't say I like to show it, but I show it because it is as simple as possibly even a politician would understand. It is only categories of people where more or less at least one billion people is affected. One billion people is 100 times the population of Hungary. So the, we have one billion subsistence farmers still on the world. This means that farmers who may live on their produce but do not participate in cash crops and agriculture uh, and, and trade. One billion more or less undernourished people and two billion people with dietary deficiencies they include the American fatty guys who uh, chips and, and, and burger generation, but uh, definitely this, uh, therefore it is two billion. Two bi one billion slum dwellers. Uh, I mean, when I was in the UN system, I uh, used also the politically correct terminology of informal settlements. But if you are honest, they are slums. It's, uh, it's, no one in this room would like to be one of these people. One billion people without access to safe drinking water, two billion, as Andra said, even 2.6 billion without adequate sanitation, two billion people without access to modern forms of energy. Everybody talks about Africa that AIDS is a killer. Much more people die in Africa because of in-house smoke inhalation. Maybe twice as many as in AIDS. Everybody talks about retroviral drugs, but no one talks about modern forms of energy, providing women with cooking devices, which pro uh, prevents that they inhale uh, uh, noxious gases. Now, of course, this is already more than 10 billion people, more than we have in the world. So there are double counting, except the subsistence farmers and the slum dwellers are definitely different people. So it's already 2 billion. And if you take it, at least one third of the human population is living a life which none of us consider decent or acceptable in the 21st century. Now, the question is very simple. Can a world survive the technical or water questions and inequalities? Andras explained this one issue. Can a world survive where one third of the population is having no chance to live a decent human life? or what any of us would consider. And, and I would say we are not representing the whole world, but intellectually we, or ethically, we would probably uh, come to a conclusion that it is not sustainable. Now, migration is, of course, one of the solutions to rectify it. And uh, when we look into this process, there are very simply five way, there are two major factors push and pull. So the push is that some uh, uh, root causes uh, and uh, pushing uh, the people away from the are into some locations where they expect something better. These are the pull factors. And some of these push, mainly push factors, but even some pull factors, could be environmental factors. We always, when we started this research, argued that environmental deterioration is a push factor. Then suddenly we saw an article, we said that uh, in Spain they found out that 60% of the migrants are because of environmental reasons. These were rich European retirees who moved from Britain, Ireland, Sweden to Spain because of better weather. As Andra showed, tourism would survive and tourism would flourish on climate change. So the environmental migrants into Spain are Northern Europeans who come because of the sun. Uh, there is also one thing which is here, existence of migrant networks. It should not be underestimated the bridgehead function. It found out that in Britain, the uh, Bangladeshi and Pakistani in migration is not coming from the whole countries 
from these two source countries. They are coming from very specific regions where the first migrants arrived and family links and feedback and information loop uh, triggered and uh, the local help the first migrants provided to the, old, uh, the newcomers uh, contributed to these bridgehead functions. In a way, you can say the bridgeheads in Europe have been established. Do you know, 100 years back, what was the second biggest Hungarian city in the world? No. Cleveland. Cleveland. Cleveland, United States. Uh, when I mentioned one third of the population of Sweden migrated to the US, as far as Hungary is concerned, it was still the big historical Hungary. It was 1.5 million people, almost 10% of the population migrated to the US, creating Cleveland the second biggest Hungarian city 100 years back. It's still, if you go to the market, you still find market women who offer their food in Hungary three generations later. So this is a point to how migrants can integrate into a society. If we are simplifying, and we have to simplify because it is so complicated matter, and in order to see the main lines uh, of, uh, uh, of the problem, we have to simplify, you find that you can boil down the question to four uh, questions. Where are they from? Where are they heading? Who are the migrants? And how many are of them? And these four questions, of course, they are also scientific questions, but they are also political questions. And the answers provided are many, uh, in many cases, are not scientific. And as we are dealing now with human beings, their despair, their aspirations, their wishes, their fear, it is included not only as scientific rigor, but politics, compassion, human solidarity, or the lack of it, and all this is involved. So we are uh, now, when you see a migrant, the question is, hmm, but what do I visit? Am I afraid that he or she is bringing something new to me? Or do I help? How can I help? What has, should have been done before? And what is the policies we have to trigger? Because more or less everybody agrees that 500 million Europeans cannot absorb 500 million migrants. Uh, what is the numerical magnitude we are talking about? And uh, already back in the late uh, 20th century, and how many are environmentally motivated, forced, or flying migrants? The, this category we tried to find that is people motivated because of climate change or water shortage to move? How many have to move because things are, won't improve? And how many are fleeing, like in the case of Katrina, uh, uh, hit New Orleans back in 2005. These estimates were uh, relatively modest for the beginning of this uh, century or millennium. In 2010, it was uh, forecasted by Norman Myers, a British uh, uh, geographer, to 50 million. Uh, unfortunately, he was quite accurate because in 2016, the UN High Commission of Refugees reported 60. Yes, I mean uh, global state. Of, uh, it, it is more a kind of, of time base. In 19, 2016, 64 million people were refugees. Of course, uh, uh, everything is very, and as the estimate is for 2050 is 200 million, and the Christian aid NGO estimated that it could grow up to 700 million. Potentially, these numbers are probably right. Uh, there are huge uncertainties, uh, few data, and migrants are not really communicative. Uh, they do not tell the reasons, and sometimes they do not know the reasons. Uh, our own research showed that uh, when we asked in Western Africa people, why are you mig migrating, they said, I cannot make my livelihood. And then the question, what is your livelihood? OK, pastoralist, uh, subsistence farmer, environmental change. Uh, uh, everything is collapsing. So finally, it is environmental or, uh, service uh, deterioration triggered, but they experienced it as income uh, shortage. Uh, the question is, for scientists, is very difficult. How can an environmental or water signal 
be measured in such a complex and frequently irrevocable decision as migration. Certainly, it's very difficult to tell to anyone that you are a water migrant, but it is also would be very short-sighted to say that all what Andras said and I try to demonstrate has nothing to do with migration. So there are very many underlying basic facts and trends which we have to uh, show. That from these distorted world maps, Andras showed one, and I showed two, one of the net immigration source countries. This includes also a relatively well-organized labor migration. And you see this beautiful large yellow spot here. Do you know what it is? Philippines. The Philippines and the Philippine economy is based on migrants. They are having university programs where men and women are trained as health workers just to go to the Arab Peninsula. So they are not even aiming to work at home. Millions of P Filipinos abroad sustain the country through remittances. You see also Eastern Europe as a labor pool of Western Europe. We have in Hungary right now labor shortage, which is ridiculous, but it is a fact. Uh, and you see that some of the continents are much smaller. And when we go into the net immigration, where the people heading off, you see the bloated United States, and you can see very well France, the Benelux states, Germany, and some of the continents almost disappear. So the Heading, where are they heading, is a quite well-established fact. Uh, uh, the German uh, um, Council for uh, Global Environmental Questions advising the federal government drafted this map with the hotspots and crisis areas, and we overlaid with the three major migratory routes which do exist, uh, whether you are coming through the uh, Balkan route or crossing the Mediterranean is basically the question of opportunity. You have two south-north and you have basically an east or east-west route depending on mainly from Central Asia. Uh, you can say that Japan is well protected because the China Sea is more difficult to cross in a rubber boat than the Mediterranean and the Japanese are probably much tougher than the Europeans and you have to cross China to get there. So the route is a little bit more difficult than going through Libya. And again, something which anyone can download from the internet, where the right spots are there where the people want to go. And these right spots are not only the rich countries, these are urban areas. And then we come to the point where you can say that actually uh, the migration does not start at the Mediterranean coast. It starts in the most cases in a rural exodus back in those countries which are the source countries. And uh, there again, for the rural urban migration, there could be two major patterns. The pull factor based uh, migration, which happened in Europe, uh, in uh, Asia, happening when these big mega cities grew up, as Andras showed. And the other one is a push factor based where rural poverty and despair driving people to cities to receive social benefits and became part of closer to the political power because political power is universally city-based or urban-based. Now, this second part is happening in Africa. Africa is the fastest urbanizing continent of the world. It does not explain by economic growth, it, there are no uh, powerhouses popping up in urban areas, but in many parts of Africa we have shortage in the rural areas. It's in incredible in a continent as you will see. The common results of both is an unregulated mass migration towards cities, stressing the urban areas, and uh, uh, there is uh, also the hotbed to create the increasing potential and observable trends for cross-border and transcontinental migration. Because irrespective, even in the poverty-driven urban migration, people in urban areas are still better off than in rural areas. So we have a huge, huge, uh, 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 how should I say, uh, uh, injustice toward rural people. Of course, this is unstoppable. 
and it was unstoppable in the last couple of centuries. If you see that the 100 largest cities of the world, the average size in 1800 was 200,000, uh, 120 years ago it was 700,000, and just 20 years back it was 6.2 million. The 100 biggest cities average size is 6.2 billion uh, million people. And now it means it's accelerating. How far it is continuing, good question. How many people will have to remain in rural areas to uh, produce our food? Because I don't believe in urban agriculture. It's nice to have a cabbage in your, uh, your backyard, but it won't feed the world. Now, if we take the present economic models, United States or Netherlands, probably the two most successful agricultural countries in the world, uh, I don't have a figure from Brazil, but probably it is 2% uh, of the population is in rural areas and producing the food for hundreds of million people. So if we are a little bit more modest, you can say that on a global scale, probably 5% of the world population will have to remain in rural areas. It means that we are heading to still further urbanization. It's not bad per se if it is organized, if the cities are prepared, because a number of services, also cleaning sewage water is easier technologically in cities, and cities can pay for it, not as like in urban, uh, rural areas. But this is a major change, an additional factor which is taking place. These two pictures I can jump because Andra showed them. Now, this is also a, that historically some of the megacities grew in areas which are absolutely water stressed. So it, Beijing, uh, also some Indian cities, Cairo, but also in Western United States, it means that the cities with their economic power are uh, getting water from other pixels of the world, so they are impoverishing water wise other areas. The so famous water market in California means that the cities can pay off the farmers, so they abandon agriculture and the cities get the drinking water. But if the farmer sold its water, it cannot produce food. He may have the money, but not, not the produce anymore. There is also a man-made problem in it. Some 20 or now almost 40 years back, the World Bank and other donors were persuaded by stupid Western and Northern NGOs that agricultural and rural development is dead, everything will be urban, give the money to cities, and you see the huge slump almost halving the development aid provided for agriculture and rural development. These 20 years of the last century is partially a stupid, man-made additional stress fueling this rural-urban migration and impoverishing the rural areas. The trend has been changing right now because, after all, some people recognize that it is uh, not necessarily a good policy to uh, just fuel an ongoing and very uh, difficult trend. But you see, again, the discrepancy between the promised and the disbursed health. So saying something in New York, like SDGs, and doing at home is sometimes different. This has been shown again, and it shows in an additional factor. And when, uh, when, when environmental or water migration, the question came up, the two big events in 2004 and 2005, the uh, uh, Indian Ocean tsunami and uh, Katrina, proved that it does exist. And in case of New Orleans people, did not, many of the people did not return to the place. Now, the problem is, of course, that as we deal with water, we have a world map which shows, of course, where uh, you see the two colors, yellow and red, there where the people are. Uh, you see that in the developed part of the world, you have a high stress on biodiversity, but you have a fairly good human water security. So where water supply, sanitation, flood control, navigation use, etc., uh, is more or less uh, balanced. And you see the red spots where both systems are stressed. So you are uh, not saving the environment, but in the same time, you are unable yet to provide the necessary services, cre creating something people find comfortable to live with water-wise. 
And this world map shows the trends in it. You see that the green trends are maintaining it. The blue would be where improvements are made. And the dark and the yellow areas where the trend is still getting worse. If you look into uh, general political questions, where the people come from, you see that the brown areas are the likely sources of migration and the green areas are the likely sources of the target areas. Now, Charlie Burrush-Marty says that to maintain this system, which is unsustainable per se, costs these countries 750 billion US dollar a year to make this, what he says, a stupid business as usual, uh, first impair, then repair. So we need a big paradigm change, and it's difficult to say because this paradigm we exercised since 150 years, to say that what are a more uh, environment-friendly solution of the water problems which does not create uh, the side effects and improve the water security, water supply, sanitation, and so forth for people. Again, Andra showed this picture. It shows that we are uh, swimming in the same dirty water pool, but it also shows that these are very powerful messages that the agricultural countries are, and their livelihood are extremely dependent on water, water variability, and, uh, therefore, and, and also the big changes show that there is no buffering capacity. Andra showed this picture as well and mentioned later the great Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, which would increase this 43 to 620, and this dam is going into operation this year. But it still would be the last in this uh, series. But there are fortunately some trends. I'm not praising any dam by say, by per se because they have environmental impacts. They can be used for better. They can be source of conflicts. But all what we have to do, non, there is no solutions where everybody would stand up and applaud. There will be people who have to somehow uh, cut back on consumption or on aspirations in order to have a more equitable and hopefully sustainable world. Let me concentrate only on Africa at the, towards the end of my lecture, not because uh, there are two reasons. I know it a little bit better than the Middle East. The second is that if we talk about the present Middle East migration, then it's of course where bullets are flying and people are uh, uh, running away is a very natural situation uh, that people do not want to get killed. In Africa, except a few little flaring up uh, violences, I would say that relatively peaceful compared to other areas of the world. Now, the problem is for, uh, Andra showed again this old uh, slide when she said Africa is also in balance. And both Europe and Africa in 1980 had roughly the same amount of people, some less than 500 million people in 1980 in the two continents. By 2016, Africa has 1.2 billion inhabitants, almost three times or two and a half times. We expect in 2050, 2.4 billion people, and by 2100, 3.2 billion people in Africa. This means that these are, uh, by the end of the century, 82% of the population growth in the world would happen in Africa. And this is, again, not science. It is a Guardian in January 2016. It's a recent publicly available information. The main reason is that the fertility of African women in childbearing age did not decrease the way as it was expected and as it happened in Asia and in Latin America. So this uh, is whether it has some historical, traditional, or, or whatever reasons, this is unfortunately not my business. I mean, unfortunately, that I'm not a social scientist. I'm also not a reproductory health specialist. Uh, but this is definitely the biological background of why Africa's population explosion is happening irrespective of AIDS, irrespective of uh, uh, um, smoke pollution, irrespective of the 6,000 children dying, many of them in Africa from water-related uh, reasons every day, irrespective of all that, we are having a huge population explosion there. 
Could be that these figures are wrong, could be that there will be miraculous changes, but the 1.2 billion people are already there. And as it said in Hungarian, a Selem Makiota Palazk ball, the genie is out of the bottle. So, and you cannot put it back again. There are two very interesting features of African migration which are not really known. The one is I'm calling the invisible migration, because in Europe we have a very Eurocentric view. We realize African migration when the people reach an Italian port or they arrive in the Spanish agriculture as illegal laborer. So, uh, and I uh, use the nickname African iceberg because an iceberg is 90% below the water, you see only 10% of the iceberg. And this is the 10% we see in Europe because for every migrant who reaches Europe, nine others are migrating within Africa. There is a huge migration in moves. No one noticed when in, in uh, Ivory Coast, the uh, political situation turned a little bit unstable. 1.1 million people of laborers from Mali went home and were absorbed by a country of 12 million poor people. No one noticed. There was not a single news. 10% of the population moves back and forth. Can you imagine that suddenly, uh, how many hundred thousand, 200,000 Hungarians work in the West if they suddenly would come home? It would be an outcry. Uh, okay, uh, and uh, these nine people are contributing also to the fact that in Africa this huge urbanization is taking place, but there is also trans-border migration in Africa. I will come to it later. The second is a substitute migrant. The substitute migrant is a well-organized, partially illegal action. Uh, the Western family clan selects a young male member they put together the money, they finance its passage to Europe and expect this young man not to marry, not to have a family, but to send back home remittances to the family and keep them afloat. This is illegal but win-win. If you go to Germany and buy Spanish uh, vegetables, uh, this is likely to be produced by migrant Africans in the uh, huge glass houses in Spain. I said if you would lead uh, the top of these glass houses, you would see a lot of uh, African workers who are hiding and may not even coming out of the glass houses because they are illegal. But it keeps sometimes 40 people in Africa afloat. Uh, but it is exploitation. It is ethically not right. It works and, and it, it is a kind of emergency movement, but okay. Water-wise, what does mean it, Africa? We, I just put here three big rivers. Two of them, the Congo and the Orange, are flowing into the Atlantic, the Zambezi into the Indian Ocean. And you see that in the <coughs> tropical uh, equatorial zone, the Congo, I call it the 100% river, has 354 liter per square uh, meter uh, uh, runoff. It's bloody water rich. It's not tapped because Congo is always in, in some civil war. So as in a kind of a regional or continental solution to think of water in Africa without the Congo is something like having a religion without God. There are some, but uh, yeah, okay. Okay, well, have, have a baptized without water, okay. Uh, the Zambezi is still a rich uh, river, but it has only 17% of the water per square meter as the Congo. And if you go down to the Orange River, which is originated in, in Lesotho and flows through South Africa, uh, Botswana and, and uh, uh, Namibia, it has only 3% of the water richness of the Congo. Comparison, the Danube is 78% of the Congo, and it's very evenly distributed. So you see the advantage of the uh, temperate zone in interannual distribution and also the water richness we are basically enjoying. Basically, South Africa will suffer more, so this percentage, which is already very low, will certainly be jeopardized. But South Africa has a fantastic uh, water system. The country of 2.4 million square kilometers has 569 reservoirs over 1 million uh, cubic meter and eight ones over 1 billion cubic meter storage space. 
and the, but of course this eight store already 40% of the water. Now, so you have in f eight spots 40% of the available water. You need also very elaborate transbound interbasin transfer to bring the water where the water is needed. All this is done partially contrary to environmental objectives because it's uh, 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 foreign water in a basin. What climate change tells or uh, anticipates that around 250 we have at least uh, uh, close to two centigrade increase and by the end of the century South Africa would come very close to the temperature raise what Andras called uh, the doomsday scenario when everything collapses to the five to six degrees. Now South Africa has, as I showed you, a very well developed water management and agricultural system but already now it is a net importer of foodstuff already now. Uh, the remaining development potentials are very scarce. Some South African farmers are already farming in Zambia and in, in, in Mozambique because of water shortage in their home countries. Climate change does not augur well for South Africa. Its population is still growing, not extremely, but growing, while South Africa is still a target country of inter-African migration. So South Africa is a target for African migration. However, from Cape Town southwards, you have only uh, uh, seawater. And human beings are unlikely to become uh, marine creatures within an adaptation period, uh, short, short period is needed. So a migratory wave from Africa exceeding the present one has no other option ultima ratio but swap towards the north. So the, I'm not commenting on some questionnaires which said that two-thirds of Africans said they would like to live in Europe because I, if someone asked me where I want to live, I would say Monte Carlo or Switzerland or it depends which part of the year where. Uh, uh, this does not mean that all two-thirds is uh, becoming migrant very soon, but it tells about the dissatisfaction of the people with their present life. And again, a lot of political science and political analysis is needed. Why Africa, more than two generations after getting independence around the 60s, is worse off in many aspects than when independence came into these countries. But if we go again to the global pictures, you see that the hotspots, which are all related with water, fresh water or salt water, are in the global south. And in April and May, I had the pleasure to be a scholar here at IASC, and as uh, Professor Mislivets was frequently on trip collecting funds and, and, and meeting scientists abroad, uh, I had the pleasure to use his office as a refuge. And I was sitting on his uh, 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 big table, not, not on his desk, but the table where he discusses with visitors, and there was a beautiful book written by Russian scientists, and from there I took, and, and when I was a little bit fed up with my own studies, I was sampling in the books of Ferry, and in one of the book I found it, uh, this uh, Welcome to the Arctic Century. If there is a promised land at all, this we can discuss, this is in the far north. To get there, you need a huge migration. You have the Russian army. Uh, I don't know the Canadian, but the US army is also there. So watch out. Thank you very much. <laughs>